I think you're very right that uh, the State Department is seen as the peacemakers and the Defense Department as the war makers. But if you ask any diplomat, any American Foreign Service officer, what the mission of an American diplomat is, and that's to, that is, uh, all would agree to promote U.S. interests abroad. Those interests are peace, of course, but it's also broader. Uh, it's economic interests, it's our uh, promotion of our values, um, creation of our image abroad. It's uh, a broader mission. Professionalization of the Foreign Service was extremely important because the challenges abroad have become more complex, uh, uh, more difficult to deal with, and it really does take a focused cadre of people who dedicate themselves to that study, um, both regionally and, and just the art of diplomacy. It isn't something that uh, you can just pick up or is intuitive. Uh, it's something that you study, you spend a life doing. Uh, it's truly a profession and a career. You know, it, it's funny because the best moment in my 29 and a year half career in the American Foreign Service really happened in the first three months of my first assignment abroad. Uh, I was in Laos. The communists had just taken over. The embassy had been, uh, had shrunk from thousands to nine of us. Uh, but we had quite a large staff of local employees. Of course, we didn't want to let go. Uh, the communists had just come in. They closed the market so people couldn't buy food in the markets. Uh, our local employees had a lot of money, but they couldn't buy food. Uh, most everybody else in, in the city of Venchon got their rice distributed through the Communist Party, but they weren't distributing it to our employees. They were hungry, rich but hungry. And uh, I saw this as a problem. I went to our administrative officer. He's a crusty old guy left over from the war. He didn't want to be bothered. He just wanted to serve his time and retire. I went to the boss, the charge, and he says, well, if you can come up with a solution, go ahead and do it. So I is a brand new uh, Foreign Service officer. I did. Uh, I worked the papers. We imported rice from Thailand uh, on ferries across the river. And the and I'm getting up to this because the best moment was standing in the parking lot of the American Embassy as we watched three big trucks roll in loaded with sacks of rice and our employees broke into tears. And that was a moment uh, for me. Uh, my next boss, and soon to be met mentor, uh, Richard Holbrook, put words to that feeling when he said, Wendy, always remember, put people first. Well, I worked for Richard Holbrook when he was Assistant Secretary for uh, East Asia. Uh, but I can remember, just as the President Clinton had just won the presidency, and he came into my office at that point. I was working in the Middle East Bureau. He flopped down in a chair in my very small office, and he says, you know, the one job I want, my first choice, uh, is to handle the negotiations in Bosnia. Now, he wasn't to get that job. Uh, that went to Reggie Bartholomew. And it was, he was sent off, actually, to ambassador to Germany. And it wasn't until a couple years later that he got the job, I believe, as, uh, um, as negotiator for Bosnia. But, but he didn't care about status, remarkably, given his reputation. He cared again, as I pointed out before, about putting people first. Well, uh, our concept was to project America, American values abroad by the way we live. Uh, contrary to the military, we send our families. We go with our children. We go with our spouses. We establish American schools. We get involved in the communities. We get involved in the civil societies and the place, places we go. Um, we live American values. We go to our churches. We have uh, diversity within our staff. Uh, we don't shrink away from that uh, in order to be, you know, politically correct, for example, by not 
having a woman as an ambassador to, let's say, an Islamic state of Pakistan. I was the first American woman ambassador to Pakistan. We don't shrink away from that. that we project our values by the way we do our business. That's beginning to change, and I think it's unfortunate. We're beginning to um, project our diplomacy the way our military uh, does, and that's to send, uh, uh, leave families at home, uh, send just the workers out, uh, emphasis on force protection, barricades around our embassies, and, and I think we lose something. Uh, we are unable to show the local people the way Americans live in that in the, that circumstance. Well, I think it's a very difficult question, and I think we're trying to find that balance. I would start uh, here at home in Washington by not playing the blame game when things go wrong. Uh, there, there have always been diplomats who've lost their lives in uh, service, whether it's being bitten by a cobra or a bacteria uh, or by terrorists. Uh, I think all diplomats uh, understand the risk of serving abroad. We're willing to take it. Uh, I don't think any of us in losing our lives would like to see it become a politicized event. And that, uh, it's a tragedy. Uh, but it's also an act of, of heroicism. It should not be an act of gotcha in the American political game. Well, let me let you in on a little secret. When you're stationed abroad uh, in the diplomatic community, other ambassadors and other diplomatic missions look to the United States for leadership. Uh, so you ask, how are our diplomats involved? Uh, it's assumed that the American, quite often it's assumed that the American ambassador and the American embassy will know more, be better informed, uh, and take the lead in bringing others together for those discussions. Uh, and that is one reason why I strongly believe that the United States can never not have a policy on almost any issue. Uh, so we, we are leaders in the multilaterally, even in bilateral situations. When facing a really tough issue abroad, such as a terrorist group, a terrorist state, the easy thing is, a lar is to first turn to a very large, overwhelming uh, military invasion like shock and awe. It's dramatic, it galvanizes the population, it makes it difficult for the opposition in this, in this uh, Congress, for example, to vote against it or be labeled unpatriotic. Uh, but it's very rarely the best first option. Uh, uh, and I'm really talking about the 2003 Iraq invasion. Uh, we saw that that did galvanize support, but it didn't, it didn't really lead uh, to a sustainable outcome of peace. It's much harder to do what uh, President uh, George Herbert Bush did, to take six to nine months, put together an international coalition, burden share so that uh, no one state particularly the United States, pay for everything that, that is shared uh, among others. Uh, and to go in with a, an international legitimacy, uh, if you have to go in with military force, and ultimately Saddam Hussein was given lots of opportunities uh, to back down first, and we did go in. But we went in in a, in a legitimate way. That's the harder way. And I think President Obama may be facing that now. It's this. His approach is uh, much closer to uh, uh, Bush the father than Bush the son uh, in putting together a coalition uh, to go to take military action, but to take it in a legitimate, uh, sanctioned way. Much harder, but ultimately much more sustainable. Oh my gosh, it's. It's, it's uh, very difficult on families. There are some 
families, family members who aren't, didn't choose the career, um, but they're dragged around from place to place uh, along with the uh, principal. Uh, some take to it, some don't. My own daughters, for example, loved their life in the Foreign Service. They said, Mommy, we had the best life ever. We were little children in, uh, in Laos where it was free and lovely, and we were uh, teenagers in Geneva. Uh, so they loved it. Uh, but it's very difficult on marriages where both partners want to work and pursue their careers. My own marriage broke up, uh, and that was hard. Um, but there's always a second point. Is that, is that even marriages that hold together, uh, when you take your children abroad, you face real danger. My daughter, for example, uh, when we were living in Laos, stepped over a cobra that was on the stairs of the front porch. Uh, the dangers of not so big animals, uh, bacteria, viruses that can uh, threaten our children. We were in Laos where there was no hospital, no hospital. We'd have to cross the river into Thailand, and in the middle of the night, of course, you couldn't do that. Uh, these were the risks and the fears that, we, that you do face. And then, of course, the risks and fears of uh, exposing your families to random acts of terrorism, uh, of uh, car accidents, of crazy drivers and bad roads, of air pollution uh, if your family, family member has asthma. Uh, these are the kind of clean air and clean water and Good schools, these, we take these for advantage here. Uh, they don't always exist. Love it. I loved every minute of my life in the Foreign Service. It was challenging. I felt it was a mission uh, worth doing, protecting American interests abroad, wonderful colleagues. Uh, no day was ever the same. Uh, it's an exciting career. Well, you know, when I came into the Foreign Service in 1975, uh, there were very few women in the diplomatic corps. Only 7% of our diplomats were women. I came in in 75. It wasn't until 1972 that they changed the regulation that uh, obligated a woman diplomat to retire, to quit if she married. So uh, my cohort were really the icebreakers, the glass ceiling breakers. And I never felt, I always felt, that my male colleagues were supportive, helpful, uh, welcoming. Um, n I never, ever felt challenges from within the Foreign Service. I'm frequently asked, how could a woman possibly be a diplomat or be an ambassador to an Islamic country or a, tough dictators like in uh, Kinshasa, where I served, or Laos with the communist dictators? And my answer is, <laughs> um, it might surprise you. I say it's actually easier. It's actually easier being a woman diplomat and a woman leader for three reasons. One, um, when you're in a female ambassador, you represent the United States of America. You're treated with the respect of our country. It's almost like a third gender. Secondly, um, you're dealing with counterparts, ministers, foreign affairs, at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs who are, who are cosmopolitan and educated and they want to show it and do. And third, um, men like working with women. Uh, people like getting along. It's, it's, it's not really a problem. Well, I think it's important to plan. Uh, I think uh, having a strategic plan and having it uh, at the State Department and being coordinated with uh, other elements of our government is very important. So I think it's a, a worthy effort uh, if it doesn't get too bogged down. Um, when I said earlier that every day in the Foreign Service was uh, different, you really didn't sometimes know what issue you would be working on that day because it would have happened overnight. Uh, you, you can't get too married uh, to a strategic plan either. It's got to be flexible, uh, perhaps even more flexible than uh, uh, a strategic plan developed at the, at the Defense Department because uh, we are at the, uh, uh, we are responding to events in different countries that also occur 
and change rather quickly. Well, I think we were discussing it earlier in that how, how do you provide the space for diplomats to uh, meet with their counterparts, meet with people, get around the country, get a feel for the place, uh, understand what's going on by getting out of the embassy uh, at this still time protecting uh, their security. And I think that there's a conundrum there that we haven't found the answer to yet. Um, but we've got to be a little more, more relaxed about it. Between India and Pakistan? India. Well, we certainly hope so. Um, I think there's a, from what I can gather, a, an inclination on the part of uh, also newly elected Nawaz Sharif in Pakistan. Uh, whether he'll be able to, to uh, achieve his aspirations in moving closer to India, in both Indian and Pakistan interests, it's clearly in Pakistan's economic interests, people of Pakistan's interest. Whether the, uh, those that resist that, primarily from the military, um, will allow it. And there is at least a theory out there that the current problems in Pakistan, uh, the demonstrations against Prime Minister Nawaz Sharif, led by Imran Khan and his party, and by uh, Qadri, uh, Qadri uh, challenging the legitimacy of the election of Nawaz Sharif, which was kind of insane since he was, was elected in an overwhelming uh, way, um, wasn't at least silently condoned by the military because they're unhappy with Nawaz Sharif's first move, move towards India, but secondly, his resistance to uh, letting President Musharraf leave. Uh, that is a drama that's still playing out, so we'll see. The hostility between uh, Pakistan and India go back to the partition and the uh, dispute over Kashmir. And I think that's much has been written on that. But look, these, these guys uh, they had been neighbors, had been brothers. It's the same DNA. They actually have more in common than they do differences. Uh, so they need to get uh, over Kashmir and find a resolution for Kashmir. I think the Kashmirians have moved on. Uh, there's now a very active movement among Kashmir to for autonomy and independence. Well, they were very offended and opposed by it, asked for the same deal and were not given it. It's a very dangerous situation uh, in Pakistan. When I was, you know, it's not often talked about uh, and I don't know why, but when I was still ambassador to Pakistan in December of 2001, India and Pakistan came very, very close to nuclear uh, warfare then. Um, uh, it was, had been triggered by the, by the really unforgivable terrorist attack in front of the Indian parliament in December of 2001. But to his credit, Secretary Powell negotiated effectively and, and lowered the temperature on that uh, near uh, uh, configuration, but uh, it's, it's still a danger, and it could flare up again. Well, I hope so. The Chinese-Pakistan relationship is very close. Um, the uh, close Chinese military relationship with, with um, Pakistan military is very close. So if that became uh, a trend in the region, one would hope that it would uh, influence the Pakistani military. Coming up, re recalling the lowest point in my career is perhaps easier than almost any answer to any of the questions that I've given you today, because I very it's hard almost to forget it. And, think of it almost every day, and that was the bombing of the International Church in March of 2002 when I was Ambassador to Pakistan and two lovely people in our community, in our embassy, uh, were killed, uh, a wife, a mother, 
and her teenage daughter. That was clearly the lowest point in my career.